Lizzie Janssen, Chief Executive Officer of Swedbank Rabur, Lim Chiao Kat, the Chief Executive Officer of GIC Private Limited, and Neil Shen, the founding and managing partner of Sequoia Capital China. Welcome. Th thank you, Eric. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning to all of you. Um, so following on from that very upbeat early panel about uh, rising geopolitical uncertainties right now, we are going to focus on uh, exactly what Eric has asked us to do, rebuilding. How are we going to get growth in a world where you can no longer rely on loose monetary policy and fiscal stimulus? Uh, we have geopolitical uncertainty. We have no easy solutions in terms of loose fiscal and monetary policy. But we need to get growth going. And we have luckily here around me some of the biggest asset allocators and with the am biggest uh, amounts of private capital around. Um, so let's go straight into it. I want to I, I, and we have 36 minutes, so I want us to talk about four topics. Where will the growth come from? How do you boost innovation? What's the, pri what's the role of private capital? And how do you link the two, particularly in the energy transition? So Chaukat, can I start with you? Uh, you are a, you know, a large source of funds. Um, where are you in this new environment looking for growth? What regions, what uh, sectors? Right, well, uh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> let's, you know, look at the macro picture, right? I will start with uh, the higher real interest rate. That's a big headwind for almost every asset class. So that already is a, is a difficult starting point. But having said that, uh, especially for long-term investors, Having higher uh, asset yield is a good thing because if you look at long-term return, uh, the compounding of higher yield is, th is the driver of uh, longer-term return. Now, with that in mind, of course, you look around the world and you know, looked at, I guess, the different growth and inflation mixes, uh, you would see that uh, you know, we are still dealing right, with the inflation pressures. Uh, but there have been some good, you might say, structural developments. I would, in fact, uh, highlight uh, the U.S. as an interesting market. Uh, valuation may not be quite there yet, but if you looked at some of the longer-term uh, trends, for example, the government incentives to really re-industrialize the economy, that's a big positive. And uh, we are pretty confident that down the road, uh, we should be able to find you know, good investment opportunities out of that. And there are some other trends of uh, supply chain realignment that should benefit countries in this region, perhaps India, you know, Mexico. Uh, so these are also places where, you know, you could see more capital allocation. Thank you. That's, that's a great place to start. So the U.S., supply chain realignment, the incentives that are coming from U.S. policies. Khaldun, what's your take on this? Where are you looking? I think very similar. Um, we look at the same lens. I think particularly us in Singapore, we have a lot of uh, uh, commonality in terms of how we think and how we look. Uh, I think we, you have to look at the, uh, the, half, the glass half full. So uh, I think when you look at inflation, uh, high inflation, high interest rate, at the end of the day, I think this is a much needed correction that's happening in terms of uh, where the world was going over the last uh, five to seven years and the adjustment that's coming about right now, which I think for investors such as ourselves, you know, looking at it from a long-term perspective, uh, the valuations now are coming to a much better place. Uh, I, I, think, I still think there's more pain, uh, uh, generally speaking, but I think we will have more opportunities than less opportunities in the time uh, ahead of us. In terms of sectors, I'll, I'll answer you just quickly, in terms of sectors and in terms of uh, the geographic look. Sectors, very much the, the same thematic spaces that we in Mubadala have been focusing on for the last five years. You know, what we define as areas with headwinds remain uh, thematically the same today as they were probably five years ago. Energy transition remains a very core area of investment for us. Uh, life sciences, uh, the healthcare space, I think, again, thematically remains a focus area for us. Technology, digitalization, uh, digital infrastructure, and infrastructure also. So I think these spaces remain and haven't changed thematically for us. We remain, I think, very uh, firm in our views that this, these, are, these are sectors with headwinds, sorry, with tailwinds, and, uh, and we will continue to invest in those spaces. Uh, geographically speaking, I agree. I think the U.S. market remains, I think, a very, very uh, attractive uh, market, even 
as we see valuations now uh, adjust there, I think it'll be more interesting in the time to come. Uh, it remains, I think, a core area for us. We're focusing a lot on Asia. We're doing a lot in Asia, uh, across Asia. Uh, and that, uh, again, from a growth perspective, we see a lot of growth potential there as we see supply chains readjust. Uh, and as we see some of the markets also, again, awaken. Uh, you mentioned India. Uh, India is a very, very interesting market. Uh, we were talking uh, as, as, you know, in the, uh, behind the scenes over there about Indonesia. Indonesia is another very interesting market. But that continues. I remain also very uh, keen on growing our portfolio in China. So I think overall, China, India, Japan, Korea, uh, Southeast Asia uh, is an area of focus for us. Interesting. I'm going to get to China in just a second, Neil. But Lisa, first, I wanted to bring you in and, and, and have, are your customers behaving differently now? Do you sense a change in this new environment of higher rates, uh, less stimulus? Any change from Europe? Yeah, definitely so. And um, just put the perspective, since I'm an asset manager and not an asset owner, I'm, the allocation is partly or mostly driven by the customer's allocations. And it, since it's a lot of retail customers, it's an interesting pattern to follow. Uh, but uh, yes, of course, they're, they're taking down the risk. But the interesting part is how we actually future-proof the portfolios. Because if you have a global portfolio, and as you said, Claude, where, I mean, we moved and we sort of swifted the portfolios completely and we started five years ago. So it's a lot based on the thematic investments and those sort of themes that you're mentioning about securing the future. So the, the, the chaos in the world, if I can use a word that strong right now, doesn't fundamentally change anything in our allocation because we are really trying to find those sectors that are there and looking at the future growth. So when I speak to my portfolio managers, there's no change in that, but of course they're looking more at healthcare. So, so not much security. asset allocation change. No. Despite the, that's interesting. Yeah, but uh, uh, a, lot, a lot going on. And of course we see also that the bonds are sort of growing in interest now that you can actually get a, of a, a decent deal there. But most importantly, I think also when you look at the future perspective is that you shouldn't only look at the risk return perspective, but if you add a sustainability in it, then you get the long-term horizon, and then it's easier to navigate in this environment. So, so that lens makes you think more long-term. We're going to come back yeah. to that later in this conversation. But Neil, first of all, China, the one part of the world that doesn't seem to have been doing terribly well recently um, economically is China. Uh, how are you thinking differently, and particularly actually venture capital in China, um, are you thinking differently about uh, investing and allocating capital in this new environment? Yeah, I think, first of all, I'm going to talk from a, you know, probably a global perspective. Clearly, I have a lot of focus on, you know, on China. Traditionally, over the last 17, 20 years, we always looking for growth. And that growth is still there. Uh, I think if you're looking at uh, some of those new sectors, uh, you know, climate tax definitely become the mainstream of all the uh, you know, uh, um, investment uh, uh, you know, resources. Uh, you know, the launch of this... Uh, uh, you know, climate coalition highlight that, that this is such an important topic. Uh, obviously, new energy is a very important part of it, but not just limited to new energy. Uh, we have metaverse, XR, you know, AR, VR, and we have healthcare, uh, which is always a very important area. And all those growths still driven by the same parameter, technology innovation. On the other hand, in the recent times, in recent months, we are now actually looking at investment from another angle which is value. <laughs> Indeed, over the last uh, five years, there's a bunch of uh, you know, uh, leading consumer internet companies being built, and now uh, their growth has been uh, somewhat impacted negatively because of the you know, high interest rate, economic slowdown, and so on. But they largely have consolidated the market, and they become a dominant leader in many of their sectors, and uh, they get getting a lot more profitable because less competition. And given the recent sell-down in the you know, public market, the primary market also adjusted. So we're starting to see, actually, the first time that in the tax space, the value company, the value stock, you can look at it as the investment target. So far from being uninvestable, China's cheap. Is that what you're saying? Well, even you know, in the U.S., though the valuation hasn't been adjusted that much, uh, very similar. But I would say China, U.S., if you look at a few sectors, you know, consumer internet being one of them, Indeed, valuation getting very, very reasonable. Interesting. Let's move on to the second theme, which was innovation and how you boost innovation. Because I'm very struck 
uh, Chakat, that you started off saying one of the reasons you were interested in the U.S. was the incentives for reindustrialization. And, you know, what we're seeing now, just to give you a sense, global spending on R&D exceeded 2.1 trillion last year, which is 2.5% of GDP, which is a record for quite a while. It's a global record. But the nature of the climate for innovation is now quite different. It's much more government-directed. There's huge incentives, as you say, in the US. There's huge incentives in China. Everyone's into industrial policy. It's a very keen thing. But you think that's a good thing for, for boosting investment? Well, uh, generally, it's a good thing, right? We need more money to do the long-term stuff. Uh, obviously, you have to look at kind of individual cases. Uh, but in quite a lot of areas, uh, without government incentive, it's hard to kickstart that process. Uh, let's take climate, uh, for example. Uh, this whole decarbonization is going to take money, right? It's going to result in higher costs. Uh, and even with new technology, and it's great that Bloomberg is leading this new effort on uh, climate tech, uh, you need initial capital. Uh, of course, private capital can come in, uh, but to really scale, I think uh, you really have to explore, you know, blended finance and other kinds of uh, arrangements. Uh, so, to that extent, I think, you know, in quite a few areas, government incentive is, uh, is almost a must. Uh, so, private side, uh, I mean, we continue to see private capital flowing into innovation space. Uh, of course, we all have to recognize that, uh, and Neil is an expert in this, right, that the success rate of startup is not exactly super high, right? So everybody has to go in with their eyes open. But certainly, if you look at in aggregate, it's well worth uh, private capital to go into that space because uh, they really can change the world. Uh, so as far as GIC is concerned, we are committed to do more. So when you are looking at your investment allocation now, are you looking to see how much governments are providing incentives, how much, how active the industrial policy is in different countries? That certainly is an important consideration. Now, the corollary of that, of course, is that governments, particularly the U.S. government, have also been much more active in terms of trying to disrupt the flow of technology, export controls and so forth, financial, the use, increasing use of sanctions, you know, Khaldun, how has that environment changed your asset allocation decision? Are we in a more fragmented world, and does that affect how you think about where you invest? I don't think it affects the way uh, or where we invest, per se. Uh, but if you allow me to bridge back into it by just continuing on uh, uh, what Lim was saying, uh, innovation and technology, I think, is, is a key driver. I think you heard it from all of us here. It's a key driver for us as investors, it's the future, it's what's been doing so well over the last years, obviously, and it's what's gonna change everything going forward. So we have to keep focused in that space. I think when governments uh, spur growth by supporting investment in technology and innovation, uh, in R&D, I think that's great. I'm very supportive of that, and I think it's, it's very important, and it's a good indicator, uh, I think, from an investor perspective, when we see governments do that. When we see governments support industrial uh, growth, uh, advanced manufacturing, again, that's a, that's a positive. Uh, I'm more skeptical when governments go and give just money to, uh, for people to sit at home uh, or um, to reduce uh, costs. Uh, I think that is money that's not really producing, ultimately, a, a long-term uh, net rate of return from a macro perspective. So I think going back, just to conclude that point, Supportive of, you know, and I think that's a good thing, and I think when governments do that, particularly in an educated and thoughtful way with a long-term view, I think that's a net positive, and, and we see that from an investor perspective as, as, a, as a strong indicator. Uh, going back to your question, I think, you know, uh, from a UA perspective, uh, globalization, uh, being a small country, being a country that's uh, throughout its history, uh, been a trade hub between east, west, north, south. Uh, we're all for globalization. We're all for less boundaries, uh, connectivity, uh, trade flows. I think this is something that, that has done well for the UAE and it's something that we encourage. And from an investor perspective, uh, I think it's, you know, I see the, the efficiencies of efficient, of, efficient, of efficient value chains rather than inefficient value chains that are constructed for 
you know, geopolitical reasons rather than for the efficiency uh, of, of, of productivity ultimately. Uh, value chains, and we've seen that through COVID. The world started fighting or uh, this fight against this, this pandemic in the first stage, fractured and looking at it insularly. Each country was looking in the early first wave, not in a collaborative approach, but rather uh, we've seen herding of, of, of simple stuff uh, like medical equipment, uh, N95 masks, uh, testing uh, equipment. I mean, it was, it was very difficult in the early stages. It's only when we started opening up the supply chains and working collaboratively on everything from vaccines to uh, that the world found its way out of that uh, pandemic. So I think there's a lot of value uh, in uh, collaboration. There's a lot of value in opening up the value chains, the supply chains. Uh, I see a lot of value in uh, moving away from restrictive measures. Uh, You're being very diplomatic, but can I take this to be essentially a criticism of, some, of quite a lot of current policy, which is clearly moving in the opposite direction? You can take it in whatever way you want. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is I'm supportive, non-restrictive measures. <laughs> Uh, Neil, um, you know, one of the biggest recent disruptions has been the U.S. imposition of export controls on super uh, high-end chips. Um, can you, I'm not expecting you to comment on that directly, but can you give me a sense of whether that is going to really set back the pace of innovation within China or whether there will be greater efforts to accelerate uh, to try and catch up? Yeah, I mean, when you look at innovation, uh, there, there's a few sort of areas that, I mean, so sort of uh, places that those innovations are happening. One is these uh, happen with the universities, whether it's the U.S., in, Euro, you know, uh, in China, or in Europe. The second was the major corporates, uh, and similarly across the globals. Uh, and then lastly, with the startups. So from our perspective, the third part is very important because you know, those oftentimes is uh, able to uh, really you know, make a difference and try to disrupt um, whatever you know, the big guy have. And also try to turn the first one, the, those uh, research lab scientific uh, sort of you know, uh, findings into real life applications. For that purpose, I haven't seen much change because you know, those innovators, uh, those entrepreneurs in the early stage is less effective because of high interest rate, public market sell down, or high inflation. In fact, what's more important is the investors, venture you know, investor in particular, and how they can do a better job, enable them and helping them to grow. So I think, you know, in a way, this is what exactly the role that the investor should do. And we not only just, you know, sitting there and you know, providing funding, but we should really get involved deeply uh, in this whole process. When we launched this uh, uh, you know, climate technology coalition, it, rhy you know, it reminds me one thing. Back 200 years ago, in Birmingham, UK, there's one uh, interesting organization called uh, the Lunar Society, where many of those you know, innovators uh, and industrialists, financiers are getting together, brainstorming, and try to you know, work out uh, you know, productive solutions and then obviously you know, creating the steam engines, and that's the, you know, the very first uh, you know, industrial revolution. I think we should do the same thing. We should have people from the different sort of angles and try to come together and find solutions which are addressing the global, uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, issues like you know, climate change. We're going to come to those, because climate is clearly an area where, where the private sector and government works together. But just to, to, to ask you one, one more China-related question, because I think for many people around the world are really interested in what exactly is the nature of the new degree of cooperation between uh, the Chinese government and innovation. I mean, there seems to be much greater government involvement now in innovation uh, in, in China than there was. Well, in the last, you know, 17, 20 years... No, no, in the, in the last two, three yeah. years. There, there, there are certain sectors, clearly, you see more, you know, sort of government funding. But in general, private sector is still the major driving force of, you know, the money flow. We obviously see, like, some of the, you know, provincial government set up so-called guidance funds, which, you know, uh, more or less uh, is really contributing to the limited capital, uh, you know, limited part of, uh, ca you know, uh, capital flows for the RMB. But 
you know, uh, the overseas investors and the private sector is still the major, major source of that uh, you know, innovation fund. So those guidance funds are not a big part of your life right now? No. Okay, thank you. Lisa, one important and crucial thing for innovation is human capital yeah. um, and boosting of skills and boosting of human capital. What is your sense of how uh, much needs to change there? Um, I'm not sure what needs to change, but if I sort of return to the original question about the substitutes and other things. I mean, what we need to get that innovation and get those people going all in is predictability. And uh, we were talking yesterday or someone on the panels about how you actually get more capital into innovation and to these new technologies. And that then you need, um, you need the regulations clear and you need a path forward because right now the regulations are continue to shift and the governmental sort of incentives, they, they come and go. And if you don't get that long-term commitment from the, from the public side, it's very hard to get the risk-willing private capital in there. So I think those two are interconnected. So make sure that you, you know the game plan and then you can add both add the human capital and the private capital into the innovation. So from your perspective, too much unpredictability right now? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, Chakat, where are you seeing the most promising talent? I mean, which parts of the world, where is talent moving to? Well, I, I would say, of course, they are the big pockets, you know, in the US, in China, different part, Europe as well. But really, I mean, talent's mobile. Right. I think talent goes to where other talents are. Uh, talent goes to where there's some predictability right, of the environment that allows them to do the work that they would like to do. Uh, so to that extent, I think you really have to bring together quite a few things, right? Bring enough talent to a place, or if you already have them, keep them there. Uh, and then you have to have money, right? Because you have to fund a lot of these efforts that the talents need in order to uh, take it further. And then you need the environment to be supportive, right? What is, can be down to simple things like uh, housing, visas, and, and things like that. Uh, so to that extent, I think Asia is seeing some pockets of that. Perhaps Singapore, Singapore is not doing too badly. Singapore has a bit of that uh, <laughs> benefit, right? We just have to deal with our capacity <laughs> challenge. Uh, and yeah, that's you know the way to go. Kaldun, what about you? You you when you go around the world, where are you most uh, excited about the quality of, of talent, people coming? Where are you? Which which parts? Because that particularly in the kind of innovative sectors that you mentioned, healthcare, you know, so forth, talent really is essential. Where where are you most excited about? So I think you always have to look at the education se sector. Uh, you have to look at countries where they have a strong education, primary education system, uh, um, college, graduate, uh, undergraduate and graduate. That's really the main driver. But I think the big change that we've seen over the last couple of years is this point about mobility of talent. Two things have changed. One, I think we discovered virtual and the, the value of virtual and the applicability of virtual on day-to-day -day business. Combined with now in the post, let's say, COVID era, using what we've seen from a technological standpoint of operating in a virtual environment with now bringing in mobility back, where travel is coming back and ability to move much quicker. I think these dynamics, we're going to see a change in, this, in the mobility of talent uh, from now forward that's going to be driven by quality of life, education, sector, especially a lot of the talent are, are younger folks, younger families. So I think the, the quality of life linked is also the quality of education for the children. Security, I think this is a point that is coming more and more right now as, as a critical point, um, you know, quality of life and security. And I think this is where I will, I will agree in many of the Asian countries, and again, using the example of uh, the UAE and, and Singapore, I think are good examples in which all of the above, uh, quality of life, education, um, security are you know, net positives in the selection for talent to move and, 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 and go to. Today, talent is, uh, uh, you know, it's not about nationality anymore, it's not about the V, it's about ease of movement and, and, and locations that can actually make it easy to access, easy to set up, easy to, to move, easy to operate, and then provide the, the, the technological ability to, 
to, to operate tech, technically or technologically, and the mobility in terms of the uh, infrastructure, in terms of airlines, etc. That's kind of where this is going, I, I believe. And I think uh, you know, UAE and Singapore are very well positioned in that space. Your office here growing? Sorry? Your office here is growing? Yes, in Asia. We're building operations in, 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 in many places in Asia. Um, let's turn to the structures of finance that will be the ones that grow fastest in this new world. And, and maybe, Neil, I'll start with you, perhaps somewhat provocatively. Uh, you know, has venture capital had it? Uh, well, I think um, we, uh, as I said, I mean, economic you know, cycles up and down. There's still uh, uh, it's a very, very important uh, catalyst for innovations. Uh, uh, frankly, that uh, you know, this is getting even more important today, uh, you know, than before. And come to b back to my point, I say it's important to have the venture capitalists to play a, m a more important role, just being a founding partner, but it become an enabling you know partner. Uh, and and I think today that the incubation is the uh, almost a you know uh, uh, you know a requirement to be a successful uh, you know uh, you know venture capitalist. And and uh, uh, we can play a role because we, once we have insights about the sector we operate, you can really put people together. Like, you know, we're building a few incubation centers in China. And, you know, the, the very important things like, you know, we can bring, for example, industrial venture together with, uh, you know, the KOLs from the hospitals uh, and to creating something for medical device. And we can do the same thing for... Uh, climate tech, we can bring, you know, the leading, uh, you know, battery companies together with uh, some, you know, research, uh, you know, team uh, which are developing, you know, the next generation of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, material and put them together. And that's exactly, you know, the type of uh, stuff that, uh, you know, a venture capitalist should do. We're not, you know, a just, a, you know, a financier per se, but we're rather, we become an operator. And this mm -hmm. is where I think the venture capitalists, you know, have to do. Uh, you know, uh, um, in the future, instead of getting looking at the deal flows uh, passively and, and try to be another, you know, you know minority investor. Uh, that's actually a really important point. I mean, in some ways, and I was obviously being somewhat flippant with my earlier question, but I I I in an environment where actually it's tougher, where real rates are higher, does that force you to kind of go back to what VC was really all about, um, which is finding and incubating? That's a very good question because over the last 10 years, there's some good times that you can, you know, invest in the growth companies and they seem to be, you know, at least growing valuations, <laughs> you know, every three months or every six months. And the public market has been awarded with some very rich premiums. Today, the market has changed completely. So you have to go back to say, roll up your sleeve and invest early. And how do you invest early? You have to create companies. Uh, at least participate in creating the companies. And that's not easy. And you ha it means that you have to be very specialized. Uh, you know, one thing I took notice that when I visited Silicon Valley some back 25 years ago, when I visited every single firm, I find that many of those, you know, partners are from the industries. They're really like, you know, the CEOs and CXOs. But here in Asia, I have to say, over the last 10 years, you see that, you know, up and coming, but not yet. And most of these people are, you know, you know, from consulting, from banking. I'm not trying to criticize, you know, the people who that kind of background, but look, with operating background, it helps a lot. So you can really become partner to the CEOs and founders. And that's the only way that I think, you know, venture capital can create value and creating returns. Chakat, what do you think? In this, in this sort of tougher environment where we've no longer got free money, what kind of... Um capital structures, what kind of vehicles do you think will, will you be looking more at? Right. Uh, well, I'm, I agree totally with Neil. I think the eventual, you know, uh, is going to stay as an important part of finance. It has, in fact, uh, over the last maybe 10, 15 years, uh, gotten, I guess, new structural advantage. For example, technologies now enable a lot of these startups to sell directly to customers. It used to be that they had to sell to some big you know, companies. Now you can go directly. That allows you, of course, better margins and scaling, right? So these kind of uh, structural changes are in place. So that's not going to change. But at the same time, there is scarcity of capital, right? Higher real interest rate availability of capital is a lot less. 
So I think a lot of the growth or startup companies need to be making sure that their balance sheets are strong. You know, they have the cost discipline to stay through this uh, period. And in fact, I think for those who play the long game, they will benefit uh, because some of the weaker ones will fall out, right? And they will then enjoy, you know, actually a, a more rational, competitive landscape. Uh, so certainly, I think for investors, that is still an important uh, allocation that we need to have, whether it's the early stage venture or even the growth uh, aspect of it. Lisa, I want to turn now in the time we've got left to the one area where everyone recognizes there could be huge progress, which is green investing, sustainable investing, financing the green transition that everyone recognizes is, is necessary. What do you think is still missing for private capital to really accelerate this transition? Is there any, any, is there anything on your wish list that you, you would like yeah. to see there? Yeah, I, um, I need new investment vehicles in, in Europe where I can actually allocate pension capital for retail clients into this sphere because there's a lot of value created there and I also believe that the the solutions to all the uh, most of the issues we're discussing here, and if I just speak to the, the companies presented here at the Bloomberg Forum, a lot of it is private, private capital, private companies, and they are working for the global solutions, and I can't invest in them right now. Uh, but if I would have an investment vehicle that actually allowed me not to have daily liquidity in my pension funds, I mean, there could be huge flow of capital into the sector where it's very much needed. So there's definitely a lot of potential there. So you need that. Um, Khaldun, what is, what is needed to get the scale of capital necessary, particularly to the emerging countries, which are going to be the place where this climate transition is decided? You need to get emissions down there. Is it, you know, is it what's going on in Sharm el-Sheikh? Is it the private sector? Is it new vehicles linking the two? What needs to happen? I'm clearly the yeah. Bloomberg Initiative is great, but I suspect more will be needed. So I'll use three words, which maybe some of them will be conflicting. Sprint, patience, and wisdom. I think we need to sprint, but we also need to be patient. And we need to be wise in how we invest. What do I mean by all of that? On the energy transition side, energy transition, from my perspective, is about continuing to invest in conventional oil and gas, in wind, in solar, in nuclear, in hydrogen, in all of the above. The solution is all of the above. Not let's switch off investing in, in conventional energy and let's just put all, all our investment in, uh, in renewables and, uh, and new energies. That creates the situation we're in today which is a situation where there was underinvestment for a long period of time, creating ultimately the, um, the energy crisis that we're in right now. Of course, there's other components that, that add to it, but in, at its heart, there are institutions, maybe some around the table here today, that could not have invested in conventional energy for many reasons, lack of ability to finance, uh, you know, the, the many of the uh, impediments that were put to that, and that created the challenge. I think on an ongoing forward basis, I think we need to, in my view, accept that the energy transition is a solution that encompasses all of the above. And we have to invest in all of the above. We have to sprint in investing in new technologies, wind, solar, uh, hydrogen, ammonia, etc. But we also need to be wise in continuing to invest in that transition with, with, with uh, energy sources that are available right now and then that are a critical component of that energy t uh, transition process. So sprint strength and wisdom. Neil, what, what do you think is missing in terms of financing vehicles? We need innovative financing solutions in ecosystem. Uh, it took 20 years for the solar sector, for the EV and EV value chain to really build and scale. Today, for example, hydrogen is a very, very important area. Everyone knows about it, but how to scale up? There's a, there's a big question because you know, it's a kind of chicken egg issue. We can use solar and wind to produce hydrogen, and hydrogen turn to ammonia, which could be easily transported. But you know, because the market is small for, you know, as, as people just started, right? And then you cannot really uh, take a long-term contract, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, offtake agreement, because there's not like you know, liquid you know, sort of commodity that you can lock in the price. And because of that, 
bank financing is difficult. So it's kind of chicken egg. So who can, what, what kind of financing institution can make a breakthrough so that this whole closed loop could be, so, you know. So what, answer your own question. What kind of uh, financing Yeah, I, I think we, we need, you know, leading corporates to make a big push into that. You need, you know, different type of financing solutions, mass debt, you know, mass financing, debt, equity to come together and solve that, uh, you, know, um, you know, that particular equation. Chakat, what's your take on that? And this will probably be the last word. <laughs> uh, you know, you, 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 you have a lot of money uh, that you can throw at this. Um, what, what are the structures that are missing? Well, uh, it's back to the two areas, right? New technologies. I think that, you know, if we can develop off-take market, I think that will greatly help to scale, that will lower the cost curve, that will get the whole infrastructure going in that space. The other is transition finance that uh, I think we have had some success actually, uh, for example, with uh, a utility in, in the US, uh, giving them $2 billion actually to convert from coal to renewable. Uh, and the regulators there, very importantly, uh, the regulators we would say were very enlightened, right? That they looked at this as necessary and they allow a, a slight increase of rates uh, for consumers. But that allows that whole transition to take place. So I think we need more examples of that. And right are you optimistic, yes or no, from all of you, that we are on the path to achieving that? I think we are, have to work hard and harder. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. No, Please. but definitely. Two-thirds of the global population uh, live where renewable renewable energy is actually cheaper to produce than just continue to use depreciated fossil energies. I think that says a lot. Says a lot. Yes or no? You're optimistic that we're going to get there? Yes, I'm optimistic. Yeah, but, you know, like Cardone said, we need to be patient. But I hope this time is not 20 years. Maybe it's 10 years. Thank you all. Sprint, patience, wisdom. Very good way to end. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you.